Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, welcome for another very exciting um, session of our PTA Global webinar and podcast series. I am welcomed by uh, the one and only Dr. Christian Thompson. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me, Israel. Great to be here with you all today. I'm so excited, uh, team, uh, as you've joined this call and you've made the investment of time uh, in your business and your brand and your personal education. Um, many times we get you know, anywhere from personal trainers to gym owners and operators to maybe you're an older population yourself, all right? And we'll define that here in a little bit, but maybe you're just trying to get some extra tools in your tool belt or figure out what things you need to be focused on. Um, uh, but really, really excited. And uh, you know, I think this is gonna be a great, kind of 45 minutes or so of time um, to not only pick the brain of, uh, you know, a very, very bright and brilliant uh, human being in Christian Thompson, um, but also your ability to maybe think about uh, your perspective on, what, you know, a, a topic that I think is, is a very relevant and urgent topic right now in uh, older populations. Um, so just a couple of house cleaning items. Um, you're all on mute, just so we don't have any barking dogs or yelling spouses in the background. Um, and uh, you will have the ability throughout today's time to ask questions. And I'll field those questions kind of first come, first serve. And so you don't want to wait too late to type in those questions. Um, also, uh, attached to this webinar, you'll have a couple of handouts. And so you'll want to make sure you access those handouts. Um, and then at the end of today's webinar. You'll also receive an email that has um, where to find more topics uh, that, that Christian has, has provided and touched on today, um, as well as some additional offers and things like that that um, I, I think you will find valuable. Um, and so with that, um, I want to go ahead and get us kicked off. I'm really excited. Um, do me a favor. In the chat box, for everyone that's on the call, in the chat box, I want you to type in older populations rule <laughs> go for it they do they do let's go older rule. populations rule fast as you can go for it go for it there they are <laughs> totally agree with you there israel no doubt about it definitely a great clientele to work with and can benefit tremendously from the work that we do with them and just see their lives open back up and the quality of their life and the quality of their relationships. And, and it, it's just so rewarding to have that really tangible evidence of the effect of the work that you do with, with this group, because you might not necessarily see that with people who are young or middle-aged and already are functioning pretty well and they just wanna get a little bit better but that little bit better might not be very apparent to somebody just kind of observing them on a on a day to day or week to week basis. But an older person who, you know, one week they come in, they don't have their cane anymore, or they're not limping anymore. They're not complaining about pain in their shoulder or their back's not bothering them. You know, it's just, it's so evident. And that's just such a rewarding thing. I'm somebody that just really likes to be a, a kind of feed on a kind of positive vibes. And that's what gives me like a really good feeling of what I'm doing with my life. And there's no better group to work with than to than older adults to sort of get that immediate feedback and really give you those warm fuzzies that are so important. Yeah. Yes. Spot on, man. And, and so again, everyone on the call is really tuned in to listen to you and pick your brain. And so I know I have a couple of questions teed up uh, that I know will be important to the audience. And then they probably have their own questions. We've got a lot of engagement. A lot of people feel our same sentiment, Christian, people typing in older populations rules. So I love it. Um, so let's go ahead and, you know, get into you, man. And as far as your career, your journey, um, maybe the past 20 years, and then, you know, where are we at now? Yeah, it's crazy. 20 years goes by really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, I About 20 years ago, I was just finishing up my PhD at the University of Kansas, go Jayhawks, in kinesiology. Um, previously, as an undergrad, I studied meteorology. I was going to be a weather guy. Um, sometimes I still wonder what would have happened if I went down that path, what TV station I'd be on now, and all of that good stuff. But 
it just really wasn't for me as I was wrapping up undergrad and having always been involved with athletics and, and, and really enjoyed kind of just everything about the body. I determined that that was the path I wanted to take something into exercise science, maybe it would take me somewhere clinical, maybe it would take me even a med school, who knows. But things just kind of moved down the path to recognize that I wanted to be in an academic environment, I wanted to teach, I wanted to be around students, I wanted to have kind of the opportunity to study things that maybe had not been studied effectively in the past. So that led me to doing a master's at University of Oklahoma, doing a uh, PhD at University of Kansas, and I started my academic appointment at the University of San Francisco, which is a small Jesuit school in San Francisco. I started in 2002. So yeah, it's been almost 20 years. And ever since day one there, my goal has been to try to ensure that my students recognize what was coming at that point and what is occurring now, the fact that older adults were gonna start really increasing in population and get them thinking about ways that we could use exercise as an effective intervention to help them age as successfully as possible. So that's kind of been the, the push throughout my entire professional career. And I've had the good fortune to be able to collaborate with some fantastic academics within the research world and work on some very, very cool projects at some of, uh, some of the best medical centers in the country. Stanford and UCSF Medical Center, and then really do a lot of work on the fitness side of things as well, and work with people who are on the ground every day in and out working with this uh, really important age group. So, and really a lot of the fitness, uh, my involvement with fitness started back in 2007 with PTA Global. So talk about things coming full circle. Um, I'd been dabbling and doing workshops and getting to know some of the people who were involved with what then became PTA Global in my early years at USF. So I think I met Rod Korn in 2002 and Richard Boyd soon thereafter and Ian O'Dwyer and Michelle Dalcor, all those guys kind of in the early 2000s. And it really got me to be interested in how I could bring some older adult specific training concepts to the industry. And the first kind of really big opportunity for me to do that and start pivoting more and more toward fitness was through the establishment of PTA Global. So it's, it's, it's almost like a homecoming and, and a reflection on, on what was a new start for me about 13 years ago. Yeah, man. And it's, it's funny just listening to you talk. It, the the mind of Richard Boyd has he brought all of these experts, you know, the 25 plus experts together. A lot of these certifications out there, because um, I remember being a personal trainer where I was just trying to run up the scoreboard on certs. Um, and I had, you know, I felt like I had more degrees than a Texas summer. Um, but right. none of it mattered to my clients, right? My clients only cared how I could actually help them achieve results. Um, mm -hmm. But as I'm going through certifications, I'm maybe hearing it from one to two people on a myriad of subjects versus. 25 different people on 25 different topics where they're really experts, like 20, 30 years experience in a subject matter and literally hands on over and over and over again. And so a guy like you, I think about, you know, the 10,000 hour rule, right? Like Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. And I'm like doing the quick math and I'm like, okay, so you've got at least 20 years in this game. Uh, carry the one. Uh, that's yeah. definitely more than 10,000 hours, man. So, you know, as you think about that and you kind of reflect, what are some of the things that you would advise professionals today that are working with that clientele that really haven't changed in the past 20 years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there are certain personal qualities that just have always been necessary to be successful when you're working, um, whether it's as uh, uh, a personal trainer or a group fitness instructor, um, even in kind of these, these uh, paraclinical careers like cardiac rehabilitation, uh, physical therapy aid, that sort of thing. And it's just ensuring that you're in it for the right reason, right? I mean, so much of being successful working with an older adult or any client has to come from nurturing a relationship, developing a relationship with that person, 
and having the curiosity to really go beyond just giving them a training program and watching them as they, as they uh, have that program implemented two or three times a week. You have to listen to what they're saying, find out the things that might be bothering them or might be affecting them, and then you kind of do your own sleuthing. I can't tell you, especially with older adults, there's always comorbidities. They've always got other conditions going on. They're on medications. So it really requires somebody to take their profession seriously and dig into all of the things that are going to affect working with that client and getting the best outcomes you can from that client. So um, it just requires the person to be a very proactive, very uh, communicative person. And definitely with this age group, it's important to kind of walk that line of being respectful and deferential to older people, but not patronizing, right? Because the worst thing, uh, so many older folks cannot stand when a person adopts kind of an ageist attitude where they're being kind of uh, spoken to either like they're incapable or they're, they're, uh, they're hard of hearing when they're really not, or it takes them longer to cognitively process things. So just those communicative skills are so important to be successful with this population. And I see it all the time. I see the people that I can almost, if I, if I give a presentation at a conference and it's an interactive workshop, mm -hmm. I can immediately tell the people that have already worked extensively with older adults and those who are just kind of starting to consider adding that as a target market to their mm -hmm. business. Because just the way that they communicate and the way that they kind of show their comfort working with a different age demographic is, is very, very evident. So we just need to be, uh, we need to be adjustable, we need to communicate well, and we need to do everything we can to support and learn as much as we can about our older clients. Yeah, spot on, man. And as I'm listening to you, there, you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One, you had mentioned the interaction, right? So like, I remember being a young, you know, 20 something year old trainer, and although I had a heart for older people and I felt like I could help them, there was a lot of them that looked at me and like, youngster, like you have no idea. <laughs> and that hurt my business. So a lot of questions right. I, I get from trainers is how do I bridge that gap, right? I'm young, they're old, they may not respect or see me as relatable. And one of my, you know, one of my pitches, so to speak, to trainers was humility bridges the gap in relatability. Mm -hmm. humility mm -hmm. bridges the gap in relatability. And so by them just setting the expectation that, hey, I know there's a one or two year age gap between us, Mrs. Jones. <laughs> but let me tell you, I've worked with a lot of people in very similar situations, right? They're open to learn because I know your needs and wants are going to be very unique. And then utilizing tools like our Kaizen 6, right? That asks, it's a higher level of, of bridging the gap in communication, which you had mentioned and constantly asking for feedback. How are we doing here? I know yeah. you said that you just wanted to garden and how is that going? And mm -hmm. in my mind as a trainer, maybe I thought, well, you know, they have a posterior pelvic tilt, so I've really got to work on their hamstrings so they can get down lower, thus having less kyphotic curvature and blah, blah, blah. But they didn't care about all of those little posture things. They just wanted to move better, feel better yeah. and live yeah. better. So yeah. what, what maybe one piece of advice would you give professionals in how to bridge that age gap in today's world? Right, right. You know, that intergenerational uh, communication piece is so mm. vitally important because yeah. ultimately there's a lot of misperceptions that older people have about the way younger generations kind of perceive them. Totally. And there are misconceptions about how younger generations think older people perceive them. And mm. it kind of sets almost a, a little bit of a, uh, there's a little opposition there. Sure. So breaking through, ensuring that, I think you said it really effectively, always garnering feedback from your, uh, from your older client, making sure that you're connecting not so much to the what, okay, we're gonna work on some, correctives because you have all these postural uh, imbalances going on 
Instead, you connect more to the why, okay? So we're gonna do a really interesting mobilization exercise that's gonna help you have the best garden you've ever had this coming spring. Love it. Or help you make sure that, you know, you can, you can go on that big trip that you've been planning and do every single excursion and outing on that trip that's humanly possible because you know that you can count on your body when you do so. So it's connecting it to the why, and it's important for younger trainers to recognize that even though they're older adults, they're still living life and they're still, mm. they still have whys. They're coming to you for a reason. They probably have more time to do things. They have more whys, they have more opportunities to start doing the stuff that they've been looking forward to do for so many years. And they're coming to you to allow those things to happen. So we kind of focus on the why and then just kind of use the what to get them there. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, whether it's, it's constantly doing motivational interviewing throughout each session with them, getting feedback from them, seeing how the progress that they're making in the gym with you is being reflected mm. in the way that they feel and the way that they communicate with other people, what other people are saying to them. All of that helps to build kind of that, that continued desire and intrinsic motivation that they need to have to keep com coming to see you. So Yeah, yeah, that's huge, man. I love it. Yeah, no doubt. I love it. Bridging the gap. So, Bridget, so question, question, question for you, um, you've talked a lot about, you know, kind of being a, a Jack or uh, a Jill of all trades, you know, uh, you know, that training philosophy for older adults. Can you maybe expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And that's another, um, that's another area or a theme that really helps to um, gain some traction mm -hmm. with uh, older potential clients or an older group of potential clients. I would definitely recommend that uh, people speak to as many groups of older adults as possible in order to try to kind of nurture uh, developing this market segment. Go give a talk. Give a talk at a senior center when senior centers begin to reopen <laughs> or do them on Zoom. Do free talks on Zoom and all these older adults will hop on a Zoom presentation or uh, on whichever go-to meeting uh, platform you happen to use. And it's important to kind of ensure that older people understand that you can't just focus, they can't just focus on one thing and be okay with their fitness. Maybe when they were younger, when all of their physiological faculties were, were intact and, mm -hmm. and, and working at a high level, they could specialize in cardiovascular training because they wanted to run 10Ks or run half marathons, or they could specialize in something like uh, sports specific training because they were, uh, they're a golfer or a basketball player or a tennis player. But as we get older, just everything, because they're aging, everything starts to slide down a little bit of a slippery slope. So the jack of all trades philosophy helps to encourage older adults to consider what might be missing in their current physical activity program that needs to be added in in order to build kind of the most resilient and capable older mm. person so i call that the jack or jill of all trades philosophy so when i go and speak with somebody they might say you know i'm doing pretty well i mean i i walk three miles a day i've got i i'm in, i'm in good shape i walk all the time well, that's an opportunity to say, great, your cardiovascular conditioning and metabolic conditioning is probably pretty good. But walking isn't going to do a lot to build strength and power. Walking isn't going to do a lot to build and improve on your, your static balance, your dynamic balance. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily going to get you out of pain because you're going to walk in the, in the way that you typically walk. You're not changing any biomechanics that could modify your postural control. So ensuring that you let them know that there are so many different elements that they really should be spending some time on when they're doing their training programs, it helps them to kind of have that aha moment. And maybe they recognize, wow, it is true. I mean, I do exercise a lot, but it tends to be very uh, uh, singularly focused in the mm -hmm. things that I'm doing. 
And the great thing about delivering a jack of all trades training program, Israel, is that it has infinite variety. You spend time working on strength and power. You spend time working on joint mobility, flexibility, and, and postural work. You spend time working on um, uh, balance and agility and gait enhancement and sensory stimulation. So every single training session with the client becomes full of all of these complementary yet kind of novel approaches. And that's why I like working with older adults more than any other age group. I mean, it's constant, interesting, and variety amongst their training programs that keep me engaged as somebody delivering those programs because I'm not delivering the same cookie cutter program mm. to all of my clients. So it's really beneficial for them as the client and also keeps me kind of fresh and engaged because of the variety and the diversity of the training programs that I'm delivering. Yeah, I, I love that. And you know, one of the first thing that comes to mind as you mentioned kind of the jack of all trades is Again, I go back and I think, okay, what were maybe the things that I was missing, right? If I was focusing on flexibility, if I was focusing on strength, I was focusing on power, I was focusing on these things that I felt that they need in the human body, but maybe I wasn't focusing on the things that they needed in an emotional well-being perspective, in the human being, right? Mm -hmm. One of our philosophies is, you know, train the human being and not just the human body. And so I think that that kind of missing ingredient for a lot of trainers is they may figure it, you know, or not even know how to make exercise fun for older populations where they're laughing and they're smiling. Maybe the same affirmations they get out of a bingo, <laughs> of playing bingo where they're just having fun and they're waving their hands. How do we create that experience in a session? So I want to ask a question to the team as, as they're listening, as you're on this call and you're listening to the brilliance of Christian Thompson. Um, I love to ask this question because it always gets mixed reactions. Do older populations need to train for power? And so I want you to type in the chat box right now, either yes or no. What do you think? Do older populations need to train for power? What do you think? Let us know. Let us know. Is power important? Power. Have the power. That's right. And why? Yeah. Is it yeah. just so they can, you know, chuck a kettle, uh, a, a medicine ball or swing a kettlebell uh -huh. or swing a golf club or a tennis or a tennis racket i mean we need power right i love it so everyone got the answer correct uh we, we kind of led the question that's right it was very loaded right it was a very loaded question <laughs> but yeah i mean if you can't move fast i mean one of the biggest things that we know affects uh older adults and the a concern that they all have and can change their life in an instant is a bad fall, mm -hmm. right? And a bad fall comes from somebody losing postural control over their base of support. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes comes during movement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, oh, I was standing there and all of a sudden I fell over. That happens sometimes, but to a very, very lower proportion than people who are falling as they're walking, they're carrying something, they're reaching for something. And the way that we recover from a trip or a stumble is through moving faster than gravity. Mm. And the way that we move fast is by expressing muscle power. The way to develop muscle power is to train muscle power. So mm. muscle power needs to be an essential part of every older adults training program because it's going to build the recoverability that's so important in balance maintenance and fall risk reduction. We're never gonna remove all of the fall risks out there. Somebody studied back in the 80s and found there were 160 different risk factors for falls, both internal and external. God, now it's probably 250 because we've got uh, devices that we can be looking at and all that stuff. So we're never gonna remove the risk factors. We just need to build a body that's gonna be able to recover when inevitably, we do have some type of a disturbance to our balance and power is of utmost importance to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I, I heard it once said, you know, it's always important to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Right. 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 I love that. I love that. And it, that really hits home for me. Uh, both of my grandmothers within the past couple of months have fallen. One broke her hip. The other broke her ribs. 
Um, and we know that that can lead to, um, uh, you know, things from internal bleeding to a myriad of different things that, you know, can decline it in older populations. And so um, I know you've talked a lot um, on balance training, not just, hey, how long can you stand on a single leg? Because that, uh, that doesn't always translate into multiplanar and loaded movement and spatial right. awareness and proprioception. But, you know, what would your recommendation be on not, not just why balance training is important, but maybe, you know, the one or two most effective types of balance training that you found in your 20 plus years now working with older pops. Right, right. Yeah, there's no question that a, uh, an effective balance training program needs to be a multi-component balance mm -hmm. training program. It needs to involve a few different things. We need to be focusing on muscle strength and muscle power to be able to have stability when we're kind of moving and recoverability when we lose our balance. We also need to focus on joint mobility, the ankle and the hip, which tend, which should be some of the most mobile joints in the body, right? The ankle and the hip become very immobile as we get older and we adopt more sedentary lifestyles. The ankle and the hip help us kind of recover our balance mm. as we find ourselves in balance challenged positions. So. We need to constantly be mobilizing the ankle and the hip. Um, and additionally, we need to practice things like just how we walk, our movement strategies, get comfortable with walking and moving in different planes of motion so that if somebody bumps into us from the side, we have that lateral stability and that lateral uh, gait capability to be able to plant that foot and recover. Hmm. We have to focus on rotational motion because part of effective walking is maintaining that contralateral rota rotation between the upper and the lower body. Mm. And so many older adults lose that rotation capacity and therefore start adopting a more risky gait pattern that is not going to be as resilient to recovery if they do trip or stumble. So it's kind of, you know, we, we can throw some really fun complementary pieces at our clients when we do balance training, right? Not even to mention the cognitive elements that are necessary for us to be balanced in any situation. Most people have trouble keeping their balance and they trip, stumble, et cetera, when they are uh, multitasking, they're having a conversation, they're carrying something, they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And we know that the more that we incorporate cognitive challenge into our exercise programs, the more we develop kind of this prefrontal cortex of executive functioning where somebody can pay attention more effectively, can maintain awareness of their environment and, and then be more resilient from their just kind of connectedness to the, the environment that they're in. And that's going to help to reduce risk of falls as well. So again, man, it's just, uh, it's a lot of stuff that, creates the ability for a much more exciting balance program than okay let's practice standing on one foot you know because unfortunately that's kind of generally what the you're talking to your primary care physician i'm really having trouble with my balance so well you know maybe try standing on one foot when you're when you're brushing your teeth or when you're at the stove or whatever it might be People don't fall standing still. People don't fall just standing there. We have to train balance in a lot more of a, a creative way than something as simple as a basic static balance exercise. I love it, man. So to recap for the group, my key takeaways are muscular strength, muscular power, item number one. So don't be afraid to make some older people strong as heck um, yep. and quick as uh, you know, all get out. Um, number two is specific mobility and flexibility in the ankles and the hip because those tend to kind of lock up and then the rest of the leaning tower of Pisa just tends to kind of fall where it's going to. And so keeping right. those mobile, keeping those stable so that way the rest of the body is more resilient. And then the third, putting them in an environment of you know functional life. So if they garden, you know, having them going through some different ranges of ranges of motion, if they are carrying groceries, having them, you know, going through scenarios of like that, um, because not only does it connect the dots for them, they don't try to mm -hmm. separate exercise in life. They connect mm -hmm. the dots visually and emotionally, but it also mm -hmm. does prepare them for those uh, motions. So brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's say they carry a golf bag. 
put a weight and rack position. This is basically a golf bag on mm -hmm. your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And now let's practice some different stepping drills. Let's say they're carrying something for, for gardening. Okay, you're gonna be holding, maybe it's a body bar or, or, or something like that. And we're gonna be actually practicing getting down and back up to your flower beds and just ensuring that you're getting a sense of the tasks that mm -hmm. they're engaging in that could lead to them being at more risk when it comes to balance and just training for it, right? Yeah. And they see those, like you said, they see the connection immediately. And it's, it's a lot easier of a sell than saying, all right, we're gonna spend 45 minutes rolling out, you know, your IT band, your adductors, your calves. Well, how's that gonna help me garden better? It doesn't make sense. Right. So there's a time and a place for everything. Yep. And uh, again, it's, it's a program that should be rich and highly diverse with this population because we wanna engage them in so many different ways. Hmm. I love it. So if you're listening to this call, this would be a great opportunity to start typing in your specific questions to Christian. Um, if Whether you currently work with older populations, maybe you have a specific example of, of uh, a challenge that you're trying to overcome, or maybe you're looking at that as an opportunity to grow your business, or maybe you just, just have a passion and a sweet spot for, for working with that clientele. But you want to know how to get into that or, or how to develop a specialty. And so this would be a great opportunity for you to ask those questions in the, uh, in the question box. And so we'll field those um, as they come in. But last question on my end, uh, Christian, I know you started up AgeWell Collective uh, with a few of your colleagues. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about AgeWell Collective? Sure, absolutely. So the AgeWell Collective is uh, Something that's come out of about the last three years as I've been presenting at uh, some different conferences, I've really gotten to know three very incredible guys. Robert Linkel, who owns a studio called Be Stronger Fitness out in Sacramento, California. He also runs a program called Training the Older Adult. He's very much a strength training guy. He's a resistance training guy, and he does a lot of resistance training work with older adults in his, in his gym. Um, Dr. Evan Osar, who is a chiropractor, and he focuses quite a bit on corrective exercise, um, uh, posture, breathing, those sorts of things, specifically with older adults. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, Ryan Glatt, who works down at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, and he's very big on the cognitive elements that are associated with training older adults and improving their executive function. Obviously, I'm kind of the balance fall prevention guy. So the four of us came together to form the Age Well Collective. Mm -hmm. And it's a year long, essentially a year long education program with weekly webinars, with case studies, with some uh, live Zoom events. And our goal, along with a program design tool and a program assessment tool, a, a client assessment tool, our goal is to ensure that everybody has the tools necessary to know how to build the most effective, again, integrated sort of jack of all trades program mm -hmm. that ensures that we are hitting the most important elements that we need to incorporate into our older adults training programs. So it's kind of been a joy working with them. I mean, one of the greatest things about about fitness is unlike some, I mean, in academics, Israel, everybody like they want to like protect their stuff and publish the first paper, or kind of protect their data. And it's a little bit isolating. So what's mm -hmm. been really great is collaborating and the collaborations we see in fitness, which really no better example than PTA Global starting with 25 guys all coming together to present their knowledge uh, 13 years ago. Having these four guys that I'm working with on a weekly basis, we're learning from each other, we're learning from our AgeWell Collective members, and we're creating kind of this, this real focus on how to most effectively address the most important age demographic out there, ensuring that older people can enjoy their later life and and have the quality of life that we all really deserve as we get older. We've waited for this time of life and hopefully we have the opportunity to enjoy it to the max. So that's what the AgeWell Collective does. I love it, I love it. 
So uh, we've got a lot of questions uh, coming in, and so we'll try to tackle these uh, as much as we Great. can in today's time. Uh, so question from uh, Ariel here. Um, Ariel asks, um, how much of the population would you say of older clients, like in that specific demographic defining older clients, um, would you say are coming in for just the kind of the social experience in the gym? Yeah, great question. Um, there's no question that for older folks, socialization is so important. It's definitely important for all age groups, but as we get older and roles change, a person retires, so they're no longer the doctor, they're no longer the lawyer, they're no longer you know, the business owner, they're now retired, it's really easy for them, and maybe they lose family members, spouses, things like that, their social connections begin to just shrink over time generally. So the importance of staying engaged with people is, is vitally important. So having communication opportunities, maybe it's through small group training or even group exercise, uh, older adults really gravitate toward that. Many of them, you know, they can't, that's what hooks them. They come in because they know, well, I hate exercise. I know I need it. Next thing you know, the reason why they're coming back is because they love to chat before class and after class mm. with the other participants. They might still groan and grumble during the class and not be overly happy about doing it, mm. but it's a way to engage them. And the, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shut down a lot of these uh, venues where older adults can come together. Senior mm -hmm. centers in San Francisco, they shut down at the beginning of March. Uh, a lot of the uh, CCRCs, Continuing Care Retirement Communities, mm -hmm. they shut down to the outside world at the beginning of March and they haven't reopened. So now group exercise isn't being offered as much, small group training, even trainers can't get into work one-on-one. -on -one. So it's important to look for creative solutions. Our program in San Francisco, which is called Always Active, you can find it at alwaysactive.org. We're a government-funded program that delivers uh, health promotion and exercise programs all around San Francisco. We now are delivering classes on Zoom, and we have over 100 people, 100 older adults, coming on each day per week watching these classes, participating in these classes, and we leave 15 minutes at the beginning and at the end where people can just chat with one another. They look and great. the first thing you said to me, Israel, when we came on, you're like, I love this colorful picture, picture behind uh -huh. you, right? So, you know, Mary might be over on one side of San Francisco and Jim might be on another side and they're talking about what they see in each other's apartment or they're showing their dogs in the background. So it creates not only a time for exercise, but we specifically build in time for socialization because if we don't have it, that's where depression, anxiety, all of those things that are connected and really equate to, according to uh, the science, the equivalent of smoking 13 cigarettes a day, which is the effect of loneliness, uh -huh. we're able to address those as best we can given the challenging situation we're in. Mm. I love that. It's it's interesting just listening to you talk and and even Ariel asking the question around community. One of the rules of thumbs, you know, back when I was in the the gym business, is we wanted each new member that came in on like a tour to speak to at least three other people other than the person touring them. And it didn't even wow. have to do with whether they were old or young. It had to do with the fact that we wanted to build more trust, rapport, and touch points, so they had second, third, and fourth best friends in the gym. Because we knew that if they felt more comfortable with more people in the gym, then that probably would influence their decision to sign up. And so I think about older populations and knowing how important the social and the community aspect is for them. So anyone on the call that is in the gym you know, business and maybe is looking at it, okay, how do I acquire more members or improve my, you know, my, my member retention rate or anything like that? It, it could just be something that's very simple to say, hey, on every single tour, whether old or young, but specific, you know, specifically for older populations and in, in what they may value, you know, make sure that you introduce to three people on the tour, thus building that sense of community and connectedness. So I love that. Um, another great question here from Sarah is, you know, with the consideration of low impact 
um, in you know, uh, just exercise in general. Do you think the rowing machine is a good tool for older populations? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you would get somebody on a rowing machine. There are certain requisite capabilities, right? We have to ensure that the person has adequate hip flexibility to be able to actually, you know, go through the full uh, uh, erg stroke. Um, we also want to ensure that they are monitoring kind of their upper body posture during the pull. Mm. We're not kind of exacerbating. Uh, a forward head or a, 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 a activated, overactivated trapezius during the pull motion. So with proper coaching, absolutely a great piece of uh, equipment to focus on not only developing more cardiovascular endurance, mm. but we really focus on joint mobility during a, a, a rowing a workout. We're going from a lot of flexion in one body part, extension in another to extension and flexion. So we're going through kind of this reciprocal sort of movement pattern and can really do a good, and the great thing as well, Israel, is that, you know, when we talk about kind of the importance of incorporating higher intensity work, mm. um, a rowing machine is a fantastic thing for that because you have relatively low impact slash no impact but you can have them go and do kind of modified hit intervals. You could even build them up to doing 20 second on, on 10 second off Tabata intervals on a rowing machine where we're really stimulating that metabolic function, but not having them do something that is really perhaps going to take a toll with high impact on their joints. Like if you have them uh, walking or running on a treadmill. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, rowing machines are fantastic. Uh, there might be a little bit of um, overcoming the concern about getting down close to the floor onto mm -hmm. a machine mm -hmm. and how it might feel initially, but ultimately get them moving and that just generates so much good mobility within the lower extremity and the upper extremity that it would be a fantastic thing to do. I'd even recommend incorporate some rotation, have them hold the pull on one arm for a while, very low resistance and focus as they come through the wow. pull, yeah. focus on torso rotation, because again, that rotational capacity of ambulation is so important, and a rowing machine can allow you to kind of unilaterally load and get them focusing on developing rotation through even the rowing stroke. I love that. I love the concept uh, of, you know, in PTA Global in our courses, whether it's in, in, in our CPT or our behavior change and exercise, we talk about you know, the importance of 3DC, you know, having three dimensions. And sometimes as trainers, we forget and we think, you know, everything's very, um, you know, same side, very linear, right, on the rower. Yeah. But just the creativity to force function T-spine mobility, right, to yeah. add some of that rotation, anti-rotation, and mm -hmm. take what could be just a, a general exercise and actually make it really – multi-purposeful in mm -hmm. their lives i um that's great that's great man i love yeah. that yeah. i love that that app. way you start seeing them they're now swinging their arms more mm -hmm. when they're walking you're just developing that yeah through a different modality but it is related so i love yeah. it Super fun. um another really good question here from carrie um, obviously, with COVID-19, um, a lot of older populations you know, may know that they're more at risk or may feel that they're more at risk so that they may be very resistant to come into the gym um, and in public places in general, but they also are maybe challenged with the virtual piece, right? They're having to get their grandkids to set it up for them. Uh, you know, this book face, I don't know how to work the book face or, uh, <laughs> right? So, so Carrie, I, I thought had a really great question in what challenges do you predict for older adults as a result of um, kind of everything going on with COVID, the, the need to interact face to face, but also the, the challenge with working remotely? What, what impact could that have in just being able to meet older populations where they need to be met? Yeah, unfortunately, it, it, it can and probably already has had some very devastating consequences and particularly our most um, at-risk older adults. So mm -hmm. the people who are most at risk are those that 
already are challenged to get out and about. Mm -hmm. So it might be somebody who's kind of aging in place at home in the first place. And perhaps they had a physical therapist or occupational therapist or a trainer coming in and working with them regularly just to try to maintain enough function to be independent. Because as soon as you lose the ability to do self-care activities or you have that fall as you're getting out of bed or, or mm -hmm. going into the kitchen or whatever it might be, those are the people that are most at risk. And they're likely to be less, uh, um, uh, they'll have less access to and less ability to connect virtually. They may not have the networks already established. They might not be a member of a gym that has gone fully virtual, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of gyms that now are doing live Zoom classes or they're archiving a lot of content. Yeah. But if you get those most at-risk seniors, if they're not already kind of indoctrinated in those environments, then they're now sort of left with not many options. So it's, it's super scary, super concerning. Um, there are some efforts to try to engage what's called in-home support services for older adults. Every county in the United States has an uh, agency on aging. And part of that is what's called in-home support services, people going into the most at need and helping them with cleaning and helping them with uh, cooking, and those sorts of things. And we're really working to try to encourage those services to just ensure people are staying physically active in their mm -hmm. homes as much as they can. Even if they can't meet with trainers, they can't go outside, they're afraid to go outside and, and work out in a group, they need to still be moving. So um, I'd say the majority, even 80% of older adults have adapted reasonably well to life of COVID-19. Mm. Again, we have over 100 people that come on to our always active Zoom classes every day. And aside from just one or two general issues, like, is my camera on or how do I turn this thing on? People minutes. have <laughs> <laughs> have adapted those things pretty easily. Yeah. But unfortunately, some are still struggling, and those are the ones that we have yeah. to worry about. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, you do provide that buffer at the beginning for those that may be <laughs> technology challenged, um, yeah. but it also yeah. is a great platform to, uh, to create the space for community and uh, back and forth uh, talking, things like that. It's great. Um, so we've got uh, another question here from Rachel. I think we've got several people here from our YMCA family. Um, YMCA is a great partner with PTA Global and, and um, go Y. Yeah, go YMCA. And and obviously with them they have you know all age ranges. Um, sure. Rachel here trains a 75 year old woman. Um, uh, you know on balance, strength, agility. She does a little bit of everything, um, but she does have some bone spurs in her neck. Uh, and sometimes uh, this makes it challenging uh, to do some of the work with weights, um, especially when she works virtually with, uh, mm -hmm. with this client. What would some mm -hmm. of your suggestions be for essential programming for, for this client? Right, right. Definitely be concerned about overhead actions, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody that's got that much limitation within the cervical spine. We want to be careful with overhead actions. Nothing higher than parallel to the floor. I'd also recommend if you're working virtually with them, make sure that you're watching them kind of more from the lateral mm. camera position. So yeah. you can be observing, you know, are we seeing, you can always be giving them attention to Great how call. they should be yeah. uh, uh, positioning themselves with upper body posture. Um, so that you can get the best feedback that you can provide to that particular client. I would definitely say with bone spurs, you're going to probably have a little bit of a limitation for um, a lot of that neck mobility work too. So if you're doing something like uh, obviously go through an extended warm up, including some gentle mobilizations, no hyperextension, but rotation side to side rotation, a little bit of flexion rotation as well. Get them warmed up for that and ensure that they're just thinking about kind of maintaining that good suspension through their torso, which is gonna to help to decompress every spinal segment. So the thing that we get worried about is when that rib cage sort of collapses onto the pelvis and they sort of just like 
have become squished down and that compresses all of those spinal um, uh, intervertebral discs. So the more that we encourage kind of this suspension and lifted posture, the less compressive force we have in the neck, which creates even a little bit of space. And that little bit mm -hmm. of space can make all the difference and help them be able to be successful. But stay away from the overhead actions. Generally, we probably don't necessarily need to train overhead actions that much unless the person is doing something that really that's part of their daily task demands. So kind of work to uh, parallel to the ground actions and really focus on positioning and posture. Yeah, I love it. So Rachel, hopefully that helped answer your question to either limit or eliminate overhead um, actions, really focusing on T-spine mobility. And then also I love the camera, camera angle suggestion from the yeah. side, yeah. look for upper cross syndrome, forward head, or any yeah. kind of uh, faulty movement patterns there. Yeah, great suggestions there. Um, let's take maybe one or two more here um, if we can. Um, so this one from Charles, um, pretty good question here. Um, older clients in his experience typically ask questions in regards to pain management, more kind of, um, you know, symptoms as opposed to cause. Um, do you provide general advice and then refer out to physicians or do you simply try to address the uh, issues at hand based upon your assessments? Right. So uh, that is one of the, the things that we need to always expect when we're working with this age group. Mm -hmm. They are going to inform you about a lot of their physical ailments that go beyond kind of things that are pertinent to mm -hmm. what you're going to be working on them with in the, in the fitness environment. So be prepared to have uh, MRI films handed to you and mm -hmm. x-rays handed to you and 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 long lists of diagnoses handed to you. It's just, it, it goes with the territory. The important thing to always um, uh, deliver as a message is that, you know, first of all, my scope of practice is within fitness. I'm not uh, a medical practitioner. I definitely encourage you to speak to your doctor if you're having new symptoms or symptoms aren't being ameliorated by, by um, the treatment that you're on now. However, we know that working on things like posture, working on breathing patterns, working on the way that we align our body, all have a role in reducing pain and improving kind of this, this uh, general overall um, uh, uh, pain-free motion that every older adult is sort of striving for. So you can let them know that through working with you and working on these different elements of a, a diverse program, you're going to be, you know, it might seem indirectly, but you're going to be directly affecting and improving their likelihood to have less of those things bothering them in the future. So you kind of direct the clinical questions to their clinical um, team but let them know that the work that you're going to do is also going to have a direct impact that will complementary uh, work in a complementary way with whatever their clinical treatment happens to be. I love it. I love it. Great stuff, Christian. Um, so kind of, you know, last thoughts here. We'd like to close out. I want to be able to wrap this up and honor our time with you. Um, but you know, where can people find you? Where can people continue to tap into your brain and, and ask questions? Right, right. I'm just giving a quick hello and let me give a picture. <laughs> hey, there we go. Um, let's see. So uh, a few things. First of all, um, I've got a couple of uh, continuing education courses that are offered through uh, PT on the net, the sister of PTA Global. Um, I think is really, you've got some info on that. So I've got one uh, course on training the active older adult and another course specifically on uh, fall prevention and, uh, and, and balance uh, training as well. Um, find me on the AgeWell Collective, agewellcollective.com. Um, that's a partnership with the Functional Aging Institute. Um, and the three guys that I mentioned, Ryan Glatt, Robert Lincoln, and Dr. Evan Osar. Um, 
Additionally, uh, I run a fitness consulting business called Thompson Fitness Solutions. Our primary product that, that is out there is the online fitness solution called Mobility Matters. And it's basically an assessment and program design platform to be able to ensure that you're developing and delivering the most customized and appropriate fall risk reduction balance training programs for your older clients. So you can find that at www.mobilitymatters.fit. Forget calm, let's go dot .fit, because that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then you can always email me at chris at mobilitymatters.fit um, and um, I'll get back to you ASAP. So lots of places, plus there's virtual stuff, there's a Facebook page, there's Twitter pages. Uh, if you look around, you'll find me and I'll, I'll always respond and, and connect with all of you as much as I can. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and uh, just like older populations, Christian likes you to send him uh, a $1 bill on his birthday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if we get enough attendees here, that could actually, uh, you know, you know, turn into a nice little, nice little profit for him. Uh, no, uh, you know, all jokes aside, uh, Christian, I want to thank you so much uh, for, for everyone. Oh, on the call. Yeah. For everyone on the call, just know that this, the call will be memorialized. Um, and so you'll be able to watch this on demand. And so if any of your team members or any friends or family, um, you'll be able to access on our website at ptaglobal.com slash events. And then you tune into complimentary webinars. We have all of these webinars from the past several months um, on demand free right there that you can access those. Um, and then we'll also turn this into a podcast. And so if you check out Spotify, we've got our fitness leaders podcast. And so Christian will uh, be on there in about a week or so. And so you can also, if you're cool. an audio learner like I am, you can also listen and go back through this because there's a lot of gold nuggets. Um, and so you don't want to miss those. It always helps to kind of replay this. So um, in, 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 in standard fashion here, Christian, I want you to close us out. What would be maybe, you know, your, your one final thought or closing message for the group? Yeah, I really appreciate all of you guys coming on, and uh, I think being a part of PTA Global is such a great move for your careers, learning from a diverse group of, of experts in the field. When it comes to working with older adults, my pitch to you would be absolutely do it. It is the most satisfying age group that I could possibly consider working with, making absolute like observable changes in quality of life gives you a lot of warm fuzzies, gives you lots of great stories, gives you a lot of wisdom and sometimes guidance that you're not even looking for, but you'll get a lot of guidance on life itself. And um, just approach it from the perspective, not that, oh, this is gonna be boring because I'm working with an older person that can't do anything. If you kind of train using this jack of all trades perspective and approach how you program, it gives you such a diversity of exciting stuff that you can help people with. Every training session should be an enjoyable um, and exciting and fun experience. So go at it, folks. Go forth and conquer. Perfect. You heard it there. Uh, team, have a great weekend. Thank you again, uh, Christian, and uh, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks very much, Israel. You take it easy.